So again, I'd like to welcome everyone viewing from around the planet by live stream video. Our next speaker is William Henry. William is featured on the History Channel, on a National Geographic, on the Ancient Aliens series, recently made a guest appearance on the Oak Island series, a fascinating television investigation. William has the very popular television program on Guy MTV. He is someone I have respected for a number of years, a true scholar, a true gentle soul. I have just met him this weekend and he is one of the kindest, most humble people I've ever had the honor to meet. So an earth keeper, round of applause for William Henry, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much. I want to just start by giving a, just my deepest heartfelt thanks for myself and my wife, Claire, for such a warm welcome here. We've loved meeting everybody. It's been very special getting a chance to get to know many of you one-on-one -on -one stopping by our table, and it's inspiring. This is why we do what we do, and thank you for all the effort that you've all made to come here this weekend to, to share and give and to participate, because without you, we, we're, we're not going to be here. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Very nice. Beautiful. Thank you. The topic of my presentation this afternoon is Watcher Angels and Human Transformation into Celestial Beings. I'm going to pick up on a couple of the themes that we talked about yesterday, and, but then advance our conversation by uh, more tightly focusing on the Watcher Angels. My presentation today is going to be pulled from several of my books, including my 2012 book, The Secret of Scion, Jesus' Stargate, The Beaming Garment, and The Galactic Core in Ascension Art. I'll also be pulling from my book, The Judgment Day Device, from 2013, Lost Secrets of the Throne of the Second Coming, The Ark of the Mahdi, and the Messiah's End Time Kit which was an extremely important topic because what most people don't know is that the events in the Middle East at their core are about the imminent arrival in the belief of many of the people, the participants in these conflicts in the Middle East, of an end time Messiah. The Jews believe in the arrival of a Messiah. Christianity anticipates a second coming. Islam, many of the adherents to Islam anticipate the arrival of the Mahdi. What most people do not know is that all three of these figures are symbolized by the same symbol or device, the Ark of the Covenant. And I will be talking a little bit about the Ark this afternoon and its role in current events because it's utterly important that we understand what the Ark really is and the importance to, of the Ark to people like ISIS, other terrorist groups who seek to create world chaos as a preamble to the fulfillment of the prophecy of the return of their selected Messiah very important subject. And I'm also going to be pulling from my 2014 book, The Lost Secrets of the Watchers, Ascension, Resurrection, and Perfection. So if there's ideas you like in the presentation today, you can follow up by uh, taking a look at any of those three, three books. So let's start with the opening paragraph of my book, The Watchers, which says, the angels of the Lord, if one could transform their body into a ray of light, and could beam to the farthest reaches of heaven as ancient ascension teachings affirm one can and one day will do, one would pass through the veil or boundary of the first physical heaven and eventually join fellow travelers in the seventh and otherworldly spiritual heaven. At the end of this path of souls is the city the Bible calls the heavenly Jerusalem or Sion, a place on the border of literary myth and eternity and the location of the throne of God of Judaism and Christianity. One of the most astounding references to this celestial realm, Sion, is found in the New Testament's book of Hebrews, which says, but you have come to Mount Sion, or sometimes pronounced Sion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Who are these angels? How did they get to become angels? Where is Sion? All of these questions came to my mind, as I'm sure they are yours, and became the focus of my book, The Watchers. In Christian art, we see an attempt to try to capture what Sion looks like based upon biblical descriptions. And in these artistic renditions, you will see the essential struggle here of humanity to rise, to elevate, to ascend, 
to leave the encumberments of the physical plane and somehow enter into these, cross over the boundary or veil separating heaven and earth and enter into the celestial realms where we find Jesus enthroned with all the saints, Mary, John the Baptist, and other figures uh, already having made this ascension or this transition. Another example, we're down here, and all the good stuff we want is up here. <laughs> but there's no bridge, there's no rope, there's no ladder, but there is. There, in fact, is a stargate that takes us from here to there. And that's part of what our quest is today, is to try to break the code of this artwork and the stargate and how we can manifest our light body to ascend into this realm. So these are stunningly beautiful renditions, highly imaginative, but also, as I said, based on biblical uh, tenets, scripture, uh, illuminations coming from people that claim they had visions of this place. John the Revelator, for example. Isaiah also made the journey through the seven heavens. Uh, we see it portrayed as a sort of a layer cake, once again, with the ordinary humans down here, and more and more as we get higher into the higher realms, we find the saintly figures, the ascended beings, the angels, the boundary here indicated by the rainbow ring. And in this particular example, we see Jesus enthroned on what's called the Merkaba throne. You see the Ophanim wheels that indicate this is the same ascension vehicle that Ezekiel ascended into the heavens upon. In Jewish mysticism, it's the Merkaba, the throne chariot of the Lord, which is something that is actually manifested from within our own consciousness. This is something the Essenes taught in Jerusalem as well as in Egypt. And so in the detail, you see Christ enthroned with stars over his body, indicating he's in his star body or light body. He's on his throne surrounded by angels called the seraphim, and we see the Ophanim wheels indicating the Merkaba throne, the throne chariot that takes us in, or him into the cosmos. Here from Padua, we see all these heads of the, the saintly figures, the angels gathered in joyful assembly at this mystic place called Sion or Sion. As I mentioned yesterday, the book of Hebrews also tells us that this heavenly place is populated by humans, transformed humans, referred to as just humans made perfect. Humans who have gone through the earthly cycle of incarnation and, and achieved a level of godliness or holiness. They've become whole, holy or complete beings. They're described as the perfect ones. They're complete. They're fully developed. They're whole or they're holy. But it's also a fact that that word perfect also means compassionate. That is the key to entering Sion, to entering and many of these heavenly realms, is to have that state of lightheartedness. The Egyptians taught the same thing. We want to awaken the heart chakra. We want to become more than human by becoming beings of pure light and especially pure love. I like to break things down to liquid so I can drink it. It has to be palatable to me. And when I hear things like this about humans becoming perfect, I don't stop. I just keep drilling down until I get to the bottom of the glass. And what I hope to offer you today is a nice healthy drink about these ascension teachings and how I've taken a lot of this data and tried to liquefy it in a way for you so that you too can, uh, can drink it easily. So perfect is for me a, our magic word. I use it as sort of a golden needle, if you will, to thread my way through various spiritual traditions. Anytime I see the word perfect, I'm starting to link it with this idea of whole, holy, complete, compassionate human beings, with the ultimate reference being the Tibetan great perfection, where we are told that humans can ultimately dissolve their body into five colored rainbow light, or what they call the great perfection, or the rainbow body of light, leaving behind hair, toe, and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted. And this, I believe, is the source of the rainbow imagery in Christianity. The reason why we see the resurrected Jesus on the rainbow is because he has attained the perfect rainbow body of light. Now, in the Tibetan tradition, they describe a path of souls, a path of transformation. Look at this image here. We see the pathway going right up a cause, invisible axis, going all the way up to this rainbow bridge here. What we notice is that the elephants start out gray. And as they go through Earth's trials and tribulations, lifetime after lifetime, they gradually start to become pink until they get up here and now the elephant is half pink, now he's completely pink, and the elephant can now cross over back and forth between the material and immaterial realm. 
This is what the, the avatars can do. The ascended masters can do this. This is what we're all in school here to learn how to do. And not to gratify myself or to stroke your ego, but I believe if you're here on this Saturday or Sunday afternoon listening to me talk, the chances are you're probably mostly pink. And when I look out here, I see a bunch of pink elephants. <laughs> right? <laughs> And many, if not all of you, I believe, are ready to cross that rainbow bridge. You're in service. You're in service to a higher ideal. You're in service to love. And you're here to embody these teachings and learn how to do this ultimate human manifestation of being able to cross over the rainbow bridge and go back and forth at will. Really astounding. And of course, the rainbow bridge leads into the pure land of Shambhala to the Buddhists. Padmasambhava was one of the great teachers of the rainbow body. And as I mentioned yesterday, I was, had the honor of being in the Shambhala Chapel recently where they teach the Dalai Lamas, this extraordinary rainbow body teaching. And it's truly just a cosmic concept that I'm just uh, grateful to be able to share with you and have had the opportunity to study all these years. So here's the, the correspondence, is that when we're seeing this rainbow bridge, we are talking about a, a bridge of consciousness, a bridge of manifestation that all of us ultimately are learning how to do. The Archangel Michael is one of the key figures because he's like Thoth or, or Tahuti in the ancient Egyptian tradition. He's weighing the heart, he's weighing the soul. The cosmic feather of truth isn't there, but this, the idea is there, is that we are all learning to awaken our heart, to lighten our heart, to become fully awakened humans so that at time of judgment day, when our heart is weighed on the scales of cosmic truth, we learn that we are then able to go on and continue our path of cosmic evolution. Michael has a really powerful jewel that he wears here called the Chintzaman Eye Stone. I'm gonna talk about that here in just a moment about the significance of that. This was the, the last judgment of, of Roger van der Voyden that we're looking at here, a really hugely influential uh, Renaissance painting. So how do we enter this kingdom of Scion? Jesus tells us that those with a blessed heart will see this kingdom. In addition, in the Pistis Sophia, one of the Gnostic gospels, he says, Cease not to seek day and night and remit not yourselves until you find the purifying mysteries which will purify you and make you into a refined light so that you will go on height and inherit the light of my kingdom. You can print that out and put it on your refrigerator door. That is our goal right there. If you're a ship wandering around out on the seas and you might be lost and you're looking for the North Star, that's north right there. As long as we are looking for these purifying mysteries that will awaken our heart, awaken our body, that's the direction we want to be going. Because our ultimate reward for this is to go on height and inherit the light of the kingdom. John the Revelator had an, a, an encounter with this light in the same rainbow bridge that we just saw in that Tibetan image a moment ago. Another pink elephant. We see Jesus on his throne in the celestial scion radiating that incredible rainbow light, holding his resurrection stick, the ascension crown, all the, the kit of tools of Padmasambhava and the other masters who have attained the rainbow body of light. If I didn't mention this yesterday, I'm gonna mention it now, that the way the Tibetans tell us they, can, they teach the rainbow body is through images. They teach that Padmasambhava as a guru can manifest through these images and imprint the teachings of the rainbow body on your genetic code. Sort of playing your DNA like we would play a piano. So the images are extraordinarily important, and that's why I've gone to such lengths to try to collect these images and present them to you, because they're not just pretty pictures. They're active images that are imprinting and unlocking the codes within your own DNA. The idea of perfection is somewhat strange in the Judeo-Christian West, but it's absolutely the core of Christian esotericism, that of the, of the Gnostics. Later, the Cathars of southern France adopted this. The Gospel of Philip states it plainly that the Lord rose from the dead. He became as he was, but now his body was perfect. He possessed flesh, but this flesh was true flesh. Our flesh isn't true. Ours is only an image of the true. So here we see a perfect correspondence between the resurrected Jesus in the rainbow body and what we see in the Tibetan tradition. It's an absolute perfect correspondence because they're talking about the same idea. 
the Gospel of Philip continues saying that we must become perfect before leaving this world. The Dalai Lama teaches the same thing. So what this means is we must become light beings before leaving this world, but also we must become compassionate before leaving this world. And that's something I take great solace in because I hear a lot of talk about secret space programs and wars out in space and all this kind of thing. And in my worldview, you know, I don't think the benevolent beings in our cosmos are going to allow us to leave our planet with nuclear firecrackers and to weaponize space. I feel that there is a boundary that keeps us quarantined on our planet, maybe even this sector of our solar system. But in order to leave this world, we have to become beings of pure light and pure love. That's my, uh, my understanding anyway. The Gospel of Philip continues saying, those who say they will die first and then rise are in error. If they do not first receive the resurrection while they live, when they die, they will receive nothing. Giving us motivation to pursue this path. This, of course, is total heresy to traditional Christianity, which teaches the opposite, that you only get the resurrection after you die and at the time of Judgment Day. I love this image of Jesus in his rainbow sheen kind of uh, robe here. It's from a, a church in Nashville where I live. It looks almost druidic to me. It's just a personal favorite. Foremost among those joyful angels dwelling in this eternal celestial city of Sion we've been describing are the mysterious watchers also known as the angels of the Lord. They're referred to in the Old Testament book of Daniel as they are a high and illustrious order of holy ones. What that means is they are whole, holy, or complete beings. They are among the perfect ones. They sit on the supreme judgment council of the heavenly court in Sion, but they also come down out of heaven. And this is something that has caught the attention of scholars and writers such as the Essenes for a very long time. How can these per perfect holy beings want to leave heaven? And how do they come out of heaven? And what are they doing here? They are called the fallen ones from certain perspectives. And all that means is that they left the celestial realms and they took on human flesh bodies. That's what the word fallen means. It doesn't have an evil connotation. It just means they are not in their celestial flesh they are in human flesh. So Christian artists try to convey this idea of the boundary separating heaven and earth with the watcher angels descending from the celestial throne where they dwelled and entering into the earth plane. So here we see God up here holding his crystal sphere, which we'll talk about in a moment as well. Here's the throne where the watchers at one time inhabited. And suddenly these guys just take nose dives off the throne and take on physical incarnation. How exactly they got here, we don't know, but we do know that they came here and took on physical manifestation, and among other things, they brought with them the secrets of heaven. Very important, because we're going to try to unlock what those secrets of heaven exactly are. So sometimes you'll see the watcher angels portrayed as uh, kind of beastly figures, because again, there's a perception that they are fallen beings, meaning they must be evil beings. And indeed, some of them got up to some serious mischief, but others are quite benevolent, as we're going to see. God, again, holding the crystal sphere. We see the throne. We see the light beings. And as they leave the celestial throne, they transform into these sort of humanoid, beastly-looking type of figures. Another example here with the throne. We see the light beings. We see them descending. Now they're taking on human incarnation. They become actual human beings. William Blake's painting captures it very eloquently, where Jacob falls asleep on the stone. He goes into a dream, sees the ladder reaching into the heavens with angels ascending and descending on either side. These are the angels of the Lord, the watcher angels, who are wearing white linen garments, symbolic of their light body. Very beautiful painting, very famous painting, carrying scrolls, containing knowledge, and so forth. We notice here that this, the, uh, the stairway actually goes through the sun, picking up another ancient Egyptian theme that our sun is, in fact, a tunnel, a sun tunnel, a star tunnel, or, if you prefer, a star gate. The New Testament says the watchers are the angels which kept not their first estate. This means that they left their original habitation in the heavenly realms and are now bound by everlasting change of darkness awaiting the great day of judgment. This is a strictly Christian perspective on them, that they fell from the heavenly realms, 
Now they're chained and they're waiting a day of resurrection in order to, be, to return home. But the key point here that I want to emphasize is that the book of Jude says that the angels kept not their first estate. Very important bit of data here. Because the Greek word translated here as first estate is oketerion, which according to Strong's Biblical Dictionary speaks to a dwelling place or habitation of the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. That the oketeron is an abode for the soul. So they're telling us that originally the watcher angels dwelled in a celestial place that they describe here as their first estate. Now what's interesting here is that this term is used in only one other place in the Bible. The term okiteron is used to describe or refer to the resurrection body or eternal spiritual light body of Christ. Now what does that tell us? That tells us that the watchers originally had exactly the same resurrection or light body as Christ. And when they fell to earth, they took on human flesh. And what I proposed to you they brought with us was the secret of how humans can transform into the celestial body of Christ to return to our first estate. This is a, a perception that's been gone unnoticed by other authors discussing the Watchers, and it's unique to my book, uh, The Secrets of the Watchers, but it's my cornerstone that opens up this idea that the Watchers are A, celestial beings, and B, they, the secrets of heaven that they brought with them were the secrets of attaining the rainbow body of light, the perfect body, the Christ body, our return to the Okiteron, or our first estate. This is another one of these really powerful active images that I'm talking about. It's by John Van Eyck. It shows, obviously, uh, the resurrected Christ with the rainbow body. What I encourage people to do when they see an image such as this is mirror what Christ is doing. And in so doing, by putting your hands up and connecting with this, the energy of this painting, you actually can receive an imprint of the rainbow body of Christ, of the, the Okiteron, or the body of the, the, the watcher angels. We notice this, the, the sapphire stone on his chest and the pearls. Another important piece of gem work that we see in this artwork. So what I'm proposing to you is that the watcher angels originally had rainbow bodies of light in the celestial realm. And I'm going to show to you in a moment descriptions in the Dead Sea Scrolls that affirm that that is the, the, the bodies that they had. And they brought this teaching of transforming into our resurrection body to earth. And as I had said, the reason why these images match is because they're describing exactly the same teaching. Whether you're talking about Padmasambhava or Christ as a resurrected being, they're both representatives of this ultimate teaching of human transformation. So does this mean the watchers have rainbow light bodies? I believe so. More, when they fell, they brought this teaching referred to as the secret of heaven with them. So what, what I'd conclude from this is that the watchers are not human. You will have researchers that will tell you that they are only human beings. They are not celestial beings. They did not come from the heavenly realms. There is no such thing as traveling into the stars. And I, I fundamentally disagree with that. I believe that the watchers, based on what we've just shown you, are celestial beings. And in fact, early mystical Hebrew texts or sects like the Essenes organized the, the watchers into an archangel hierarchy. According to this system, the watchers are the highest angels possible and were ruled over by four of their own, the great angels known as Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Ariel. They are among the quote unquote good watchers, as is Metatron who is the transformed human, Enoch. Many of us probably are familiar with this story of this earthly sage, pre-flood, probably Atlantean wise man who was taken into the heavens by the archangel Michael, one of the watchers. Michael anointed him with an oil that transformed Enoch into a glorious body of light that matched that of the other watcher angels. I propose this is Enoch's transformation into the rainbow body of light in preparation for him becoming, ultimately, getting his new name, Metatron, which means beyond the throne. Another of these watcher angels is Lucifer, Shemiyasa, and Azazel. These are the so-called evil watchers who were destined to unleash, unleash a storm on humanity. So in Christian art, when you start to see these archangels surrounding the throne of Christ, the rainbow ring, 
you start to understand that these are the watcher angels who are uh, being portrayed in the celestial realms. Now, here's another interesting aspect of this. Scholars believe that the watchers are also the mighty seraphim. These are the highest order of angels. They're called the winged or fiery serpents and burning ones. They're called the burning ones because they burn with the love of the creator. So they're often shown as bright red beings because they're beings of pure light and pure love. They have swirling bodies that are composed of pure love and light and are full of eyes, an appropriate attribute of those who watch or guard God's throne. In Christian art, the seraphim are portrayed as six-winged and covered with feathers, such as this image here, where we see the watcher angel with the six wings covered with eyes, and we see the red feathers indicating that it's burning with the love of the Creator, here actually initiating uh, Isaiah. In another example, we see the swirling or whirling type body, feathered body, covered with eyes of the seraphim. This is another example of the way the watchers are portrayed in Christian art. In Hebrew, seraphim is a combination of rapha, meaning healer, and doctor or surgeon, and seir, meaning higher being or guardian angel. Their logo is the nehushtan, the serpent lifted on a pole by Moses, which is the symbol for healing. When Moses lifts the serpent on a pole, he is identifying himself with the seraphim and also utilizing this device this sign, seal, symbol, as a, in, a way of invoking the light and love of the seraphim. The Nehushtan was a sacred object or device, as I preferred to call it, because the word device means a sign, a seal, a symbol, a tool, and an appliance, and the Nehushtan is all of those things. And it's made out of bronze in the form of a serpent. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, a seraph, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So what Moses is doing here is invoking the power of the seraphim, if not actually manifesting a seraphim at this moment to heal the Israelites. Another example of the red-winged seraphim beaming light or uh, love into the consciousness of Adam. Another example where the seraphim are now actually assisting and escorting Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. Bright red winged seraphim. These are the watchers. Another example, the Limborg brothers, where we see the bright red winged seraphim, or seraph, singular, escorting Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, while their symbol, the serpent on a pole, the Nehushtan, is shown in the background. Another example, this time now, with Christ enthroned in an almond-shaped gateway called the Mandorla, with the watcher angels on either side, because they are the guardians of Christ's throne. So it's absolutely apropos that the watchers would be there, and here they are portrayed as the seraphim. In the Jewish mystical book, the Zohar, or excuse me, the Hekelad Zaturti, we learn in a very key description of the watchers that their walking is like the appearance of a lightning bolt. A lightning bolt is plasma, a state of matter. A vision of them is like a vision of a rainbow. Their faces are like a vision of a bride. Their wings are like the radiance of the clouds of glory. The clouds of glory. Now, the word glory is a really key word here because the word glory literally means to glow rays. You know, you hear those Sunday morning preachers talking about the glory of God. <laughs> and Little do they know that they're actually talking about the, the glory of God being an essence that is beaming from these divine beings. So what we're told here is that these watcher angels have the appearance of plasma, which means they can morph between matter or states of matter. They appear like a rainbow. Their faces are like the vision of a bride, and their wings are like the radiance of the clouds of glory. So I'm just going to put a plasma ball over them. So they're plasma beings that can take on flesh and blood bodies. Remember, as rainbow body beings, they can morph. They can phase between the material and immaterial realm. They can put down their flesh and blood bodies, take on celestial bodies at will. And they also appear like a rainbow. In Jewish mysticism, in particular, a story of Moses' father's encounter with two watcher angels, one named Belial and the other, the archangel Michael, we get a profile 
of what the watchers actually look like. The complete physical characteristics of the watchers include a humanoid body, a serpentine face, a many-colored garment, hello, rising up into the air like whirlwinds, luminous or radiant bodies, feathered cloaks, many eyes, and the ability to fluidly morph or change form and shapeshift. So if we're going to get an accurate understanding of who these beings are, we've got to be able to put check marks beside all of these descriptions here. And that's what I believe we can do. We do that by matching them with the seraphim, with their whirling bodies that can morph, but more importantly, with layering the plasma layer over them, but also, and here's my original theory or take, I believe that the seraphim and their descriptions of them in Jewish Christian art match that of the rainbow body. The serpentine face doesn't mean they're reptilian beings. Look at the face of Padmasambhava. His face comes to a point like a serpent. It's very serpentine. He wears the feathered cloak in Tibetan art. He wears a many-colored garment. He can morph. His body looks like it's spinning or whirling. It matches all of the descriptions of the watchers as provided in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I matched up the seraphim as the highest order of angels who left their rainbow bodies, the bodies of their first estate in heaven, and took on human incarnation and then learned how, or came here to teach us how to attain the rainbow body. In my opinion, it's a perfect match. And it, it's, it's perfectly in line with what we know biblically as well as extra biblically about the watcher angels. So I have a, a real comfort level in suggesting to you that the seraphim and the rainbow body beings are exactly the same type of being. Here you can see the, the clear serpentine type face of one of the watcher angels, this time Padmasambhava. Remember, as I said, the term okiterion used to describe them is used in only one other place to refer to the resurrection or eternal spiritual light body of Christ. And this is the, the original body of these beings. So should it surprise us then that in the 13th century, St. Francis of Assisi had a visitation by Christ as a seraphim? The resurrected Jesus appeared to Francis of Assisi in his home in Italy and beamed to him the five wounds of the, stigma, of the stigmata, the five wounds of crucifixion, the wounds in the, in the hands, the side, and the feet. I'll never forget the moment I saw this painting in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I looked at this and said, I don't know who this geezer is, but, but why is Jesus shown as a rainbow angel? I'd never seen a depiction of Jesus as a seraphim before. I didn't even know what a seraphim was at that time. And this is the painting that prompted me to go home and hit the books and start learning about who are these beings and why is Christ shown as this speckled rainbow angel. And it led me to where I'm at today with the understanding that the seraphim are the watchers, and the watchers have exactly the same as the resurrected body of Christ, the rainbow body. And this is what the painter, John Van Eyck, is trying to express. And when Christ manifested to St. Francis of Assisi and beamed to him the wounds of, of crucifixion, he did so as one of these beings. It's absolutely profound. And this isn't the only example. There are numerous examples in Assisi. Claire and I uh, were in Assisi with a tour group that we took there this past spring studying this. And we've been there uh, before as well. And I collect these images of Jesus, man the resurrected Jesus manifesting as a seraph and beaming this enlightenment teaching to Francis of Assisi. After this event, excuse me, after this event, Francis becomes known as the second Christ. Literally, in Italy, this is, they uphold him as the second Christ because he received this attunement, this stigmata, whatever term you prefer to use from it, of it, from the resurrected Jesus as a seraph. Giotto actually started the whole thing off with this six-winged, red-winged Jesus because he burns with the love of the Creator. My sense is that these are super fast-moving beings when they're in a rainbow body. Perhaps they're beyond our human comprehension or the spectrum of what our eyes are able to perceive. And when they slow down and come into our realm, perhaps this is why they, they manifest or appear as seraphim. 
I'm not convinced that Jesus actually has six wings when he appears to Francis. It could be a, a symbol of the six wings or six points of the Merkaba star, and that this is another way of portraying, portraying the Merkaba. But this isn't the only example of Jesus portrayed as a winged seraph. A, a seraph. You, you can go to, to the Nubian Museum in Aswan, Egypt, where I took this photo, and see this fourth century or possibly 10th century, scholars can't agree, of Big Bird Jesus. <laughs> Jesus as a seraph. So somebody in Egypt in the fourth century saw the resurrected Jesus as a big bird man, as a seraph. And this same being, type of being, manifested to St. Francis of Assisi. Well, this shouldn't come as a really big surprise because Jesus referred to the symbolism of the seraph, seraphim explicitly when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but, but will have eternal life. So here's Jesus directly referring to the logo, the sign, the seal, the device of the seraphim as the key to attaining eternal life. And it's the key to attaining eternal life because it's the watcher angels that possess the knowledge, the secrets of heaven, of how humans morph into their resurrected light bodies. The watchers are largely the product of an esoteric literary revolution launched by a tribe of primarily Jewish mystics called the Essenes, who lived in Palestine and Egypt in the second century BC up until the time just after Jesus when they're wiped out by Rome in 66 and 69 AD. From the pages of the Old Testament, the Essenes, who are tremendous scholars, plucked Enoch and made a kind of superhero out of him. He's the first translated man. The Old Testament says Enoch walked with God. The Essenes developed this whole mythology about Enoch as the first resurrected man. The first translated man is the term that they use who is translated into a glorious rainbow-like celestial being called Metatron by the archangel Michael, the watcher angel Michael, who anointed him with an oil that transformed his body into glorious light that matches exactly the angels who dwelled at the throne of God, the watcher angels. We're talking, yesterday I mentioned the Egyptians had a technology where they used tones, lights, and an as yet unidentified plant that undoubtedly they made an oil out of. The Archangel Michael is here utilizing that oil to turn Enoch into Metatron. And I'd love to get my hands on some of that oil. <laughs> Truth be told, it's manufactured by our pineal gland, which is a manufacturing plant of sacred oils. So here's Enoch slash Metatron on the throne, surrounded by the watcher angels. His body matches that of Yahweh, the Old Testament God who in Israelite thought is imagined on an immense throne located in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, or possibly in Egypt, because we know the Essenes built a duplicate of Solomon's temple in Egypt. He's shown with his feet propped on the Ark of the Covenant, which serves as his footstool. So here's the Old Testament God, Yahweh, matching the description of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and others as a luminous humanoid figure with a rainbow-like aura around him. I actually took this photo in the Library of Congress reading room. It's off limits to the public. But after I did my work decoding the ascension secrets in the US Capitol, I got the notice of the Library of Congress, or, the, or the librarian of the Library of Congress. And I made dozens of calls trying to get into the, this private room where I knew this painting existed. And I finally got through to a librarian who said, OK, you can come in. And when I arrived at the Library of Congress that day, I introduced myself, and she says, I know who you are. And she says, uh, is George Nury as nice in person as he sounds on the air? <laughs> and right then, I knew I was golden. And uh, she let me uh, take this picture here that's in the very center of this room. It has seven panels. The first one's red, the next one's orange, the next one's yellow, the next one's green, the next one's blue, the next one's purple. With Yahweh in the center, I call it the rainbow room. And it's a corresponding room to what you see in the dome of the US Capitol, which has all kinds of ascension imagery. Wish we had three hours to talk about that. <laughs> what is he holding in his right hand? He's got a crystal in his hand. It's called the Chintamani stone. It's a, 
yeah, good pickup, way to go, really nice. We're going to come back to that chintz and I in a moment, exactly what that is. But here's Yahweh as this luminous humanoid rainbow-like figure matching that of the body of, the, of the, the watchers and the seraphim. You see this energy effect above his body indicating portal, sound, vibration, so on and so forth. And back to Enoch slash Metatron. Now, the thing is, we're talking about the Essenes, 150 BC, as the ones who really cooked up this idea of the watchers and of the translation of the human body into an, an ascended form. Well, according to Tibetan tradition, Garab Gorji brought the rainbow body teaching that Padmasambhava wouldn't teach for another thousand years or so from the celestial realms between 184 BC and 57 BC from Vajrasattva, who taught the great perfection in the heavens. So this figure brings this teaching to Earth at exactly the same time that the Essenes are beginning to develop exactly the same concept. There was a bridge that was built from India to Alexandria, Egypt, where this teaching was brought into Alexandria and given to the Therapeutae, the forerunners of the Essenes at this time. Buddhist missionaries brought this teaching to Egypt and to the Therapeutae, the mystic cousins of the Essenes. And this is when it all happened and started getting going. So we talk about the watchers as these fallen beings, like they're evil. <laughs> In India, they're like, you know, get a clue, guys. Okay, we're talking about beings who have the ability to phase shift between the dimensions. And in Tibetan art, when they show these guys descending from the heavenly realms, they're coming down on what looks like a space elevator. They're coming down on a pillar of light, taking physical manifestation, coming down onto the high mountains of Tibet in particular, coming down through the rainbow bridge into the earth plane, landing on a throne that looks like the Ark of the Covenant because, wink, wink, that's what the Ark of the Covenant is. It's the throne of these beings. We'll look at that in a bit of detail here in a moment. So here's another example where they're coming down this pillar of light, this stairway to heaven, taking on physical manifestation. This is the descent of beings equivalent to the watchers who are coming into the earth plane to deliver this teaching about human ascension and transformation and the attainment of what we call the great perfection or the rainbow body of light. Significantly, significantly, this was exactly the same time period that the Ptolemies, the successors of Alexander the Great, were building the Library of Alexandria and the temples of Upper Egypt. We're talking Philae, Dendera, Esna, the Edfu, the key temples of ancient Egypt were not built by the Egyptians. They were built by the Ptolemaic generals of Alexander the Great, who were looking for exactly the same mystic secrets that you and I are looking for how we become translated beings, how we achieve our ultimate resurrection and ascension. And this was exactly the time that the Essenes penned the story of Enoch becoming Metatron and becoming the Messiah initiate of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were lost in 69 AD, between 66 and 69 AD, when 50,000 Roman stormtroopers came in and decimated Jerusalem and Moon Hill, the, the Essene monastery at a place called Qumran, on the Dead Sea. Their Dead Sea Scrolls were not discovered until 1947, and they revealed that the Essenes were a mystical tribe who were obsessed with human transformation into angels. The scrolls contain their teachings about the perfection, their term, of the angelic light body composed of celestial flesh, their term. This teaching was given to the Essenes, the Essenes by otherworldly beings referred to as holy angels of the Lord or the Watchers. This Essene mysticism focused on the creation or perfection of a bodily vehicle capable of holding the higher dimensional Christ light. They knew that they were part of a long-term mission to introduce the next human being capable of holding this light, and Christ was the manifestation or the ultimate exemplar of this teaching. The Mother Mary, the Virgin Mary, being an Essene initiate who was preparing her body as the other Essenes were, based on what the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us, in order to hold this light. They first operated in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, but after the desecration of the temple, the Essenes got a new idea. They said, fuck that. We're not going to let these people desecrate our temple anymore. We're going to become the temple. We're going to make our body the temple, and our community collectively becomes the new temple. Huge religious revolution comes with that. They were preparing 
their individual bodies to be recipients of the holy transmission and receptacles of the glorious light body, and here's the key, in order to prepare between them a suitable, suitable physical vehicle for the incarnation of Christ. This is what the Essene literature is about, and this is the reason why it has been withheld from public view. It's shocking how detailed the Essenes were in their understanding of human transformation into celestial beings and how explicitly they describe it. I've spent the past five, six years scaling the ivory towers, reading the PhD dissertations in the scholarly journals that describe this. The scholars know this, but all of this information I'm describing here is yet to trickle its way down into the popular literature. I'm hoping to change that by getting up. The, thank you. Thank you. By scaling those ivory towers, networking with those scholars who, who they just can't say the word. They can't say the word Stargate. They, <laughs> they talk about portals and the Essenes going through portals and angels coming and going through vortexes and portals, but they just can't say the word Stargate. <laughs> but if they could, it would unlock the whole thing. They also don't understand that when the Essenes are saying we want to perfect our bodies, that it has the exact same meaning as what the Tibetans teach in the great perfection. If they did, they'd put all this together and understand, voila, exactly what is going on here. This literature I'm describing, which is profusely documented by the academics, this literature from their library of the community at, at Qumran is based on two interlock interlocking hypotheses. One, the, the, the theology of the Essenes took for granted the belief that in its original, true, redeemed state, humanity is divine and or angelic. That's their fundamental starting premise. We're originally angels, and we're going to get back to becoming angels. And secondly, this belief pattern was conceptually and experientially inextricable from temple worship in which ordinary space and time are transcended because the true temple is a model of the universe which offers its entrance a transfer or translation from earth to heaven, from humanity to divinity, and from mortality to immortality. In other words, the temple of Solomon was a stargate, and the, and the Essenes had the secret of turning humans into angels so that they could go through that stargate. Period. That is what the Essene literature is emphatically about. And according to Essene belief, Adam and Eve, the human race originally had bodies of light. We were born angels. This light body was our birthright, and it was referred to as a garment, as we discussed yesterday. As the Jewish mystical book, the Zohar, says, when Adam dwelt in the Garden of Eden, he was clothed in the celestial garment, which is the garment of heavenly light, light of that light which was used in the Garden of Eden. So this is the Essenes' operating premise, is that we've got to learn how to transcend our biology and get back into our original light being status, the light bodies of the Watcher Angels and the resurrected Christ. So here's an example of, from Giovanni de Paolo of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. This is the moment when we no longer have our light bodies, but instead we get our bodies of skin. And we're going to spend the rest of our uh, human history trying to learn to transcend our human condition and return to our original light bodies. The book of Genesis said, God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Traditional Christianity thinks these are like deer skin, buck skin, cow skin, whatever. But they're actually, in the esoteric tradition, they know it's our human skin. We don't belong in these bodies. We belong in our original bodies, our angelic bodies. The second thing God did is he made a gate at the east of Eden and posted angels on either side of the gate and forbade us to return through that gate, at least wearing our, our flesh suits. Once we drop the flesh suits, we can go through the stargate. That's what the Essenes knew. That's what the Dead Sea Scrolls make absolutely clear. The Essenes believed that they were not only privileged to receive the divine mysteries of the light body, but that doing so would put them in the company of the Watcher Angels. This belief is referred to in one Dead Sea Scroll text saying, O God of Israel, who is like thee in heaven on earth, who accomplished deeds and mighty works like thine, who is like the people of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And it goes on to say, instructed in the laws and learned in wisdom, who have heard the voice of majesty and have seen the angels of holiness. The angels of holiness are the watchers, and the Essenes are saying, we have seen these guys. This is a close encounter of the fourth kind, right? They're not seeing spaceships. They're seeing 
light beings manifest in front of them. We have seen the angels of holiness, and we have heard profound things. Thou hast raised me up to the everlasting height. That's a close encounter of the, eight, of the seventh kind, a human being taken into the celestial realm, realms by an extraterrestrial being. Close encounter of the seventh kind. I walk on limitless level ground, and I know there is hope for him who has shaped from the dust for the everlasting counsel. Thou hast cleansed a perverse spirit of great sin, that it may stand with the host of the holy ones. He's transformed. He is not a human. He is standing with the host of the holy ones in this celestial realm, and that it may enter into the community with the congregation of the sons of heaven. Another name for the watcher angels. This is their goal, to enter into the heavenly realms and dwell with the watcher angels angels. Angelomorphism is the scholarly term that they use. Angelomorphism, or perfection, human transformation into an angel, a precise science possessed by the Essenes. When they would greet each other, they wouldn't say, namaste, I recognize the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. Their greeting was, I hope you become an angel and you go to dwell in heaven. May you be as an angel of the presence in the abode of holiness to the glory of the God of hosts. That was their salutation they used to one another. May you attend upon the service in the temple of the kingdom and decree destiny in company with the angels of the presence, in common counsel with the holy ones, the watchers, for everlasting ages and time without end, for all his judgments are truth. May he make you holy among his people. May he make you holy. May he transform you from a human into a celestial being, an angelic being, and make you an eternal light to illumine the world with knowledge and to enlighten the face for the congregation with wisdom. May he consecrate you to the holy of holies of Solomon's temple, the innermost part of the stargate of Solomon's temple, for you are made holy. This means anybody can do this, and everybody should, right? It's not something that is gifted to you. It's something that, is, that happens to you. You intend for this to happen. You absorb this teaching. You are made this way. Scholars agree that the final vision of the divine throne room for the, the Essenes is the climax of the vision. It's the angelification that's debated. The scholars just can't go there. What are these people, crazy? Turning themselves into angels? Going through portals or stargates? Who are these people? Right? They just can't handle it. And they can't say that word, <laughs> Stargate, either. They have to debate it. You know why? And the scholars I've talked to, they, 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 they say, yeah, you're probably right. If you go along with what this, the scenes are saying in the Dead Sea Scroll, it puts up a challenge that says, hey, man, you, you can do the same thing. And the scholars are like, well, we're going to say you really can't do that because then we're not going to be challenged ourselves to have to do that. Because when you're confronted with this knowledge, that there are watcher angels, maybe in our presence right now, that can give this teaching to us and you can, you can transform in this way, you, you're either going to stay sitting in your chair or you're going to stand up. And I'm one, I prefer to stand up. I'm, I'm on this path. This isn't a path of research. This is a life path for me. And this is my hope, that I ultimately will be able to sit in the congregation with the holy ones. And that's not coming from an ego place. That's just saying this is how you can become a, a being of the greatest service possible is by following this teaching. And this is why I'm striving to do what I can to bring this knowledge out of the ivory towers and put it in the popular literature where it belongs. So these passages show the Essenes believe several things. One, they possessed the secrets of God. They learned wisdom. They heard the voice of majesty. They saw angels. They interacted with the watchers. They could be raised or translated to heaven and purified so that they could join the holy ones, the watchers, and enter into their company in heaven. In fact, this is the purpose of the community, is to purify members in anticipation of joining the, the company of angels. And clearly, angelification was their goal. And more, they sought to approach God's throne. That's their target. They don't want to just become angels just for the heck of it. They want to do this because this is how you join the angels in the heavenly realms and you sit on God's throne. John the Revelator had a vision of heaven in which he saw 144,000 souls standing around the throne of God, the target location of the Essene Stargate. They were clad in white robes and carrying palm branches in their hands. This is examples of just humans made perfect, and they've got bowling balls in their hands. <laughs> Let's 
with palm branches, celestial spheres. Really intrigued by those celestial spheres. Yahweh was holding one a moment ago, remember, in his luminous humanoid guide? He had one of those in his hand. You know what it is? It's called the Chintamani in Tibetan Buddhism. The Chintamani, the wish-fulfilling stone, believed to be, a, by some accounts, a crystal orb. You hold one of these things, you go BC, do anything you want. In Tibetan uh, tradition, in the teachings of Padmasambhava, it manifests the rainbow body of light. That's what it does. And what it says is that this being has the power of the universe at his disposal. This is why Jesus holds it too. This is called the, the resurrection sphere. He holds it in his hands. His power, it's his power ball, if you will, his power crystal. It's like the ultimate power crystal, really. And we're all into stones and crystals here. Well, this is the ultimate power crystal, the Chintamani, the Chintamani stone. Powerful symbol, mostly overlooked uh, by Christian scholars. It's, again, symbolizes the power of the universe. Here's Da Vinci's take. The, the uh, Chintamani is symbolized by three dots, the triple dots. And actually, Da Vinci reveals himself as probably initiate of this tradition when he shows in his lost Christ Pantocrator, Christ holding a crystal orb with the triple dot symbol of the Chintamani etched on the surface of it. Right there. That's Christ holding the wish-fulfilling jewel of Tibetan Buddhism. Didn't come from this planet. This face unquestionably is based on the Shroud of Turin, which means da Vinci had to have seen the Shroud or subscribed to this tradition, that the face on the Shroud absolutely, as I believe too, is the face of the resurrected Christ. Here's what this, this crystal sphere is, I believe. Pretty much sums it up, right? It's the power of the universe. It's the power of an expanded consciousness well beyond the earth plane. Can you imagine a seed essence or stone within yourself, a divine blue particle, a blue stone, blue pearl that blossoms into a new skin or garment and opens gateways in space that allows instant access to other star systems or even galaxies billions of miles away, paths that take you back to the source? That's the ultimate crystal sphere that Chintam and I and this is what these angels hold in their hand. Another fragment from the Dead Sea Scrolls, a song by the Archangel Michael, says, Elion gave me a seat among those perfect forever, a mighty throne in the congregation of the gods. He goes on to say, I have taken my seat in the congregation of the heavens, and none find fault with me. I shall be reckoned with the gods and established in the holy congregation. So they're saying here, okay, I have attained the perfection. Now I sit on the throne of God. I shall be reckoned with the gods and my glory with that of the king's son. Neither refined gold nor gold of Ophir can match my wisdom. And this author's claim has been taken up, his claim to have been taken up and given a throne in heaven, record and made perfect like the gods, and counted as one of, as one of the gods is extraordinary. In UFO parlance, this is a close encounter of the eighth kind, a human taken into the celestial realms by an extraterrestrial being and transformed into one of them. So clearly the Essenes are dealing with a, an advanced, super advanced race of extraterrestrials, they called the Watchers, who brought a teaching to transform humans into angelic beings. Now, that throne is really intriguing and I came about my, uh, the understanding I have of it uh, at present in sort of a roundabout way. I stumbled upon uh, one of this, this actual image here from the 14th century Russia of the Last Judgment. And what intrigued me about it was this conduit, this serpent, snaking its way up the center of the painting here. So I hit the books, did some research, found a scholar at the University of Ma uh, Maryland named Dr. David Goldfrank, who said, yeah, this is a really weird feature put in Russian Last Judgment art. He said that these serpents have 19 to 21 demarcations line, demarcation lines on them that symbolize, his word, cosmic toll booths. Cosmic toll booths, wait a minute, you're a scholar at the University of Maryland, what are you using a term like cosmic toll booth for, right? How about Stargate, right? <laughs> How about Stargate? This represents 21 way stations on the path between Earth and the celestial region of Sion. 
And so I started digging this up, corresponding with Dr. Goldfrank, and had a really enlightening conversation with him about Maya symbolism that matched this as well. We see the, the blessed figures going through the golden gates of Solomon's temple, guarded by the red-winged seraph here. They're taking sort of a cosmic shortcut. They're going to ride the cosmic conduit, the stargate, from Earth to Sion, because that's what Solomon's temple was. According to the Essenes, it was a gateway. And it leads ultimately up to the celestial realm, the cosmic throne of Christ. And then we have these two angels here, watcher angels, who are guarding a collection of symbols. What's that? And it took me a while to, uh, to finally figure out what that was. And I'll share with you in a moment what that is. It's very interesting. But here we see the ascended Christ up in the, the celestial realms. So this path of souls and this path of souls, to me, tells the same story. So I proposed this to Dr. Goldfrank that I think when the Russians say, we don't know where this imagery came from, I said, how about Tibet? The Mayans have similar imagery. How about the Mayans? They all have this concept that there's a celestial conduit, a cosmic serpent that links Earth with the celestial realms. And you can ride that serpent rope wormhole from Earth into uh, the, what the Essenes referred to as the throne of God. So I started collecting these last judgment images. You notice it's got a kind of a layer cake motif. Earth is down here. Here's the blessed ones, the lucky ones that are going through this red gateway here, again, guarded by the seraphim, by the watchers, because that's what they do. They, they're watching. They're, they're looking for people out here. Hey, how you doing? You've been doing your homework. You've been doing a good job. You know, your, your heart's on the pure side. You're getting kind of the lay of the land. You would understand what is happening to you if one of us manifested in front of you. It wouldn't blow your mind. You wouldn't go schizophrenic. You'd understand that this is your ascension. We're going to take you through an open portal or gateway. You're going to ride the serpent through the cosmos just like Jedi Foster, I mean Jody Foster in the movie Contact. And you're going to go into the celestial realm and a being named Enoch, who's now called Metatron, will be there to guide you through this process. And if you understand just that much, they're going to be there to assist you. And that's about all you need to know. Okay, just the big picture. You don't, I, don't know, I don't need to know how to fly the plane when I go from Nashville to London. I just need to know how to get to the airport, right? And how to get a boarding pass and, and go through the gate and get my seat on the plane. And that's essentially what they want, the Essenes want you to know as well. You don't need to know all the details, you just need to know the big picture. And these watcher angels are out watching out for you, looking for you, ready to guide you into your godhood, right? So you can be reckoned with these beings and know how to ride this serpent without freaking out. So we go from the earth plane up the layer cake up to the throne and we see the you know, similar details, the watcher guarding the gate that leads to uh, heaven, just like the airport. You, you ride the cosmic serpent, you go through this strange device here, whatever that is, and then you make your way up to the throne where Christ is sitting on his stargate with his uh, O'Phantom wheels, his Ezekiel's chariot. Right? And then you ride off. Or you might stay there with the other angels and just humans made perfect gathered in joyful assembly. Another example where you see clearly the, the, the invisible axis running up the center of the painting that the serpent is snaking his way up. It's like, kind of like a Nehushtan in a way. So, just sharing with you once again a few of these last judgment images that all have the same symbolic motifs. It's about the ascension of a human up to the celestial throne of Christ, Sion. Here the demarcations are, are emphatic and very clear for us, as is the invisible cosmic access, the open gateway with, guarded by the seraphim, similar imagery, and then these guys guarding whatever that thing is. And then Christ sitting on his throne with his feet on the footstool, that's called the Ark of the Covenant, in the Old Testament, and he's there to greet you in this scheme. Mary, John the Baptist on either side, and all these ascended beings in their bubbles of light holding their bowling balls. <laughs> their bowling balls of resurrection because they've learned the secrets of resurrection. They have the power of the universe, and they're not going to give this to just anybody. You've got to be pure-hearted, right, to, to utilize the power of love for its ultimate cosmic purpose. So what is this thing? Well, that thing right there has a name. It's called the Edomatia, or the throne of the second coming. This is the throne the Essenes were speaking about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Greek verb hedomasian means to prepare or preparation. This is the throne that was at one time on earth, or was one of these on earth, and one of these in heaven. It's like they're walkie-talkies 
when Christ wants to descend onto the earth plane, he needs a device on this side to capture his fast-moving self so that humans can interact with it. Same thing with Yahweh. This is what uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel described. So the Etimatia is the throne of the second coming that will be reconstructed, by the way, at the time of the second coming. It's most often composed of a cross, which is the instrument of transmutation that converts flesh or mass into light, a spear called the spear of destiny, a sponge, a scroll or a book, the robe of light, hello, that's our garment of light we've been talking about the past couple of days, a jar containing sacred oil, hello, that's Michael's oil, right? That's the one he anointed Enoch with that turned him into Metatron. And it also includes the Ark of the Covenant. And when you put all this together, as you see here at St. Paul behind the walls in Rome, we get Christ on his throne in the heavenly realms, but right beneath them is his sign, his seal, his device, his tool, his appliance, his throne, which is the fully assembled throne guarded by the watcher angels. It's guarded by them because they brought it here originally. And when it's fully assembled, we see the cross, we see the spear, the rod, the nails, the grail cup, the robe of light, the book, and the Ark of the Covenant. So what I'm saying to you is that what the Essenes knew, and they knew the secrets of Solomon's temple, which originally housed the Ark of the Covenant, is they knew what the Ark of the Covenant was. It's the throne of God. It's the throne that takes us from point A on earth to point B in the cosmos. Think of it as a teleportation machine? Sure. And what I've done, which is unique to my work, is to say, well, the Ark of the Covenant houses the rod of Aaron, whose name means enlightenment, the flask of manna, and the cruise of sacred oil. These are the components. It's, like, it's a kit. It's like an erector set, right? And when you have the knowledge of what to do with this erector set, you become effectively what the Essenes were on the path of becoming seraphim, the beings or guardians of the Ark of the Covenant and these tools or appliances used by these beings. Here's a very nice French depiction of the Ark. I like this one because the Ark is actually opened, right? And it reveals its component parts. Usually you see the Ark closed. It's like looking at your computer on your desktop and never seeing the keyboard, the mouse, the power cord, the software, right? It's, it, if you don't see all those things, your computer is what? Useless, right? It's only when you open the ark and pull out the component parts and assemble it that you get the throne of Christ. But the throne of Christ is exactly the same thing as the fully assembled Ark of the Covenant. And the Essenes knew that. And they utilized this as a device, as a sign, as a symbol. Here's what I think the Essenes knew. You see these two tablets right here? They're supposed to be the tablets of the law, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. They're the two hemispheres of your brain. You see this enlightenment rod right here? It's your spinal cord. You see this box? It's your pelvis. So when you put the enlightenment rod on your pelvis and you put the two tablets on top, what do you get? The functioning human, the spiritual anatomy. The Ark of the Covenant, as the Essenes understood, is within us. And when we activate it, our pineal gland starts to produce this wonderful secretion called chrism, which the Gnostics called the oil of resurrection. What does that do? It dissolves our body into rainbow-colored light, and then we put on our starry robe or garment. So what happens is, is that when we're going to go through the throne, through the stargate, we have to know how to assemble this kit of tools so that we can then transmute our body into light the starry cloak is the robe of righteousness. It's the robe of the pure-hearted ones who know how to utilize this. And recovery of, of this is our birthright. It's our light garment. It represents our apotheosis, our transformation into a divine being. And most Christians have no idea that Christ has shown ascending on this ark throne. And the reason why is because the Dead Sea Scrolls were buried for 15, 1947 years. We lost touch with the original teachings of Christianity, which is actually Essenianity. The teachings of the Essenes, which is really the teachings of the Watchers. This throne is a docking station, or a station, if you will. And once you assemble this kit within yourself, you're kind of like the toaster popping out of the oven. It says you're ready, okay? 
you're, you're ready for the next step. You're ready to activate this docking station. It's the key device of the watchers and is fundamental to the Essene belief in human transformation. And so now we can readily identify it in Last Judgment art where Christ is ascending on his winged ring held aloft by the angels, the watcher angels. That's called the throne in Jewish mysticism, the throne chariot. Otherwise, we could call it a stargate. And then we see his device up above with Mary and uh, John the Baptist on either side of him. There's the flask of the anointing oil that dissolves our body into light. There's the footstool. That's the Ark of the Covenant. That's the starry cloak, the Book of Knowledge, and the cross attached. That's the complete Ark throne device of Christ. The fully assembled device. Brought here by the watchers, guarded by the watchers, taken off the planet by the watchers to protect it, but will return to the earth at the time of the second coming because this fast-moving being will utilize it as a way to slow down into the earth plane in order to be perceived. And then, as the Essene teaching says, humans will be able to utilize that as a throne to take us into the heavenly realms. You can see his transparent Ophanum wheels here. And this is why he's always shown above it. It's because it's his. It's his device. It's his throne. It's his ultimate teaching that represents the power of resurrection. So I've gone about trying to collect as many images as possible that reflect this scene version of the Ark of the Covenant as a connecting device. The men in white carry it here. These are the watcher angels. And it's utilized, here's Jerusalem in the background, as a device to link us with this otherworldly spiritual realm inhabited by the watcher angels, as well as all the angels and joyful humans uh, who have been transformed into the perfected ones. In, Jewish, in the Jewish mystical book, the Zohar, the ark manifests a pillar or beam, a beam of light that serves as a conduit for the ascent of souls of the righteous to paradise, it's called the foundation of the Mount of Sion, which is thought of as a cosmic center. This pillar of light is a plasma pillar or conduit. It emanates from the ark and is the throne of God. In Jewish mysticism, this pillar is called Zadok or righteous and is also given to the cosmic pillar as well as the ones who scale it to heaven. I like that word scale. I, uh, purposefully inserted that in there because scale is a musical term. When you go through the octaves, you're going through the scale, right? And then you jump up to the next octave. It's the same idea here. We're scaling the ladder to heaven. We're matching our frequency with this. And we do this by becoming righteous beings of love. That's the way we scale ourselves to this pillar. If you're not a righteous being of love, chances are you're not going to see it, right? This is why the Nazis utterly failed in their quest for the Ark of the Covenant because they thought it was a weapon. Hello, yeah. read the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? They'll tell you exactly what this is. It's a beam of love. And if you're not a being of light and love, you are not going to be able to get your hands on this thing. Dr. John Allegro, a controversial Dead Sea scholar, deciphered the meaning of the word Qumran, the, one of the compounds or monasteries of the Essenes. He claims Qumran means the secrets of the pillar. Well, I totally agree with that because this is what the Essenes knew was the secrets of this pillar or beam of light, this cosmic conduit written by Enoch, undoubtedly, when he was on his quest to become Metatron and all the other beings, the ascended beings. I love this depiction here by Benjamin West. We see the Israelites lining up to get close to the vibration of righteousness coming from the ark. My wife, Claire, noticed that it appears to be resting on a, a head, right? See, here's the nose, there's the chin. It's, it's right there on the pineal gland, right? And Claire would argue that's where, that's where the ark really is. Pardon me? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Here, so here's the head. Follow the pointer. There's the, the nose. Comes down. There's the chin, right? Looks like kind of an Easter Island head, right? And then here's the ark of the covenant right in the area of the skull where the pineal gland is located, right? The third eye. Because only with the eyes of love, the open eyes of consciousness, are you going to be able to see this pillar, all right? And sometimes I look at this and I just want to put sunglasses on. It's so bright, so powerful, and so profound in this understanding. And what we must fill in, according to the, the Essenes, is the realization that this luminous pillar of light is a portal. It's a stargate 
through which the righteous, meaning fully realized, whole, holy, complete, or perfected human beings, could pass to the heavenly scion. This pillar is described in the Zohar as incandescent, multicolored pillar, the center of Eden, upon which souls are capable of ascending through an opening in heaven. We don't talk like that anymore. This is 15th century speak. 21st century speak, we call an opening in heaven a stargate. And that's what this is. It's a stargate device, okay? This is a conduit for righteous souls to a place where the righteous souls are transformed into angels. And by taking this ride, the transformation is affected. Here's how Hieronymus Bosch characterized this. He did a beautiful job. He shows St. Jerome praying before a traditional image of the Catholic crucifix. Down over here on the left, based on Cathar teachings from southern France of the perfecti, as they called themselves, he describes the ascension of a perfected soul rising through this glassy cylinder filled with stars. Goes beyond the earth plane here, symbolized by the crown of thorns, through this glassy realm here, wearing a bright white garment of light, symbolic of the light body. Goes beyond the realm of the sun and moon to some hyperdimensional realm. This is 1600 AD, Hieronymus Bosch. Wow, absolutely incredible. Anticipates beaming by 462 years or 362 years. But I believe this is what we're describing here is a technology, a spiritual technology, a consciousness technology that we today refer to as beaming. So I affectionately call the Essenes beamers <laughs> because they've been beamed a few too many times. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Just for that, I get 10 more minutes. <laughs> It's a beaming device, right? <laughs> and the Essenes are beamers because they beam or radiate light and love, but they also can dematerialize and beam through the cosmos. Little known is that Christ utilized one of these devices. Here he is sitting on the ark with his feet on the throne, ascending. Same thing here in this depiction from Egypt. Open portal behind him, going through the gateway as a transformed, perfected being. How much more fun would Sunday school have been if we learned it was all about stargates and wormholes and, <laughs> and, and turning ourselves into beings of light and love? Hey, what were they thinking in 8th century Britain when they come up with a depiction like this? Two watcher angels beside Christ on his throne while he's in front of an open gateway filled with stars and concentric rings symbolizing sound and vibration. What we're actually looking at here is a face-on view of the pillar of light. He's actually shooting up through the thing, right? So this is what I've deduced from my understanding of the Essenes. And when they, as we talked yesterday, when they put on the breastplate of righteousness and it beams this multicolored, rainbow-colored light, and they, then they tell us that there are multiple versions of this, it suggests to me that the, the clothing worn by the high priest, especially when they interacted with this incredible device, were actually activating psycho-spiritual attributes within themselves. And I believe that the rainbow color of the breastplate of righteousness symbolizes the rainbow body of light. And that when they're interacting with uh, the beings, the watcher beings in the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple, they are fully intending to transform themselves into light beings to match them. In fact, this is the origin of the word Essene. It comes from the breastplate that they wore. And it has the meaning of to be, to be complete, finished, whole, or perfect with the additional meaning of lights and perfections. And when we're in St. Paul's Cathedral in London and we see Christ as the high priest wearing the breastplate of righteous and the shimmering rainbow robe, it's a tip-off that William Holman Hunt, the, the painter, might have an insight that Christ is actually being portrayed in his ascended rainbow body of light, his perfected body, the robe of glory. And this is the ultimate mystic secret of the Essenes. And this is what we're in the process now of recovering. Once we have this, I believe that we will fully understand our place in the cosmos. That's what's at stake here, is with the revelation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Once this comes out of the ivory tower and gets into the popular literature, we are recognizing the true potential within us. Not just one guy can put on the crown of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of peace. All of us are meant to wear that on a daily basis. And as we begin to suit ourselves up for what is to come, 
we will be in the process then of transforming not only ourselves, but our entire planet. It will put us in resonance with these higher vibrational beings, the watcher angels, Gabriel, Michael, all the other watchers. And as a result, we will be on our path of not only individual ascension, but species-wide ascension as well. As I mentioned yesterday, I showed that Ptah at Saqqara was the, the god of technology as well as the god of resurrection. The Egyptians said he fashioned our body. I believe that he fashioned it as Padmasambhava showed and as Jesus, the resurrected Jesus showed, so that we can more easily or effectively attain our resurrection bodies. And the reason why you see Padmasambhava with his Vajra, the compassion and action symbol, the resurrection stick, the crown of glory, the golden rays, and the lotus throne, and the reason why Jesus carries exactly the same symbols is because that is what's within all of us. It represents our highest human aspects and our highest human uh, aspiration. And as I said earlier, the Tibetans teach that attaining this is not that difficult, really. In fact, they have a three-step process for attaining the rainbow body. They tell us you can do it first by imagining this body of light within you. And this is what I hope I accomplished in part yesterday and today, is helping you to visualize or imagine this magnificent ascended being within you. The second thing we have to do is believe that we can attain this. The third thing we have to do is live our lives with the expectation that this will be our ultimate destiny. So I hope maybe from this point forward, you will imagine this on a daily basis. You will believe in, in your greater cosmic self to a greater degree than before you came this weekend, and you will live your life with the expectation that not only you are ascending, but that we are in fact ascending as a species. So God bless you all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. You're very kind. Another big hand for this fantastic speaker. Thank you so very much, William Henry.